Today I'm going to evaluate the new Niche Duo Grinder, which comes with two pair of big 83mm flat burrs, one for espresso and one for brewing. It looks a lot like its smaller sibling, the Zero, and it shares a lot of design features, but it is a very different machine. We're going to consider the engineering, construction, and user experience with a complete teardown, and we'll do some thorough tasting of both espresso and pour over, comparing its flavors to the Zero with its 63mm conical burrs, and to the EK, which also has big flat burrs, albeit of a somewhat different design. I'm also going to taste test to see which pair of burrs does the least violence to the type of coffee that it's not designed for. In other words, can you get away with making pour over with the espresso ones or espresso with the brewing ones? Or is that just a bad idea, period? Now, if you enjoy cheerful reviewers who quote manufacturers' specs and try to predict how those variables might manifest themselves on your palate, you've come to the wrong channel. Around here, we measure carefully, examine closely, and test thoroughly. So settle in, we're going to evaluate the Niche Duo in depth. Oh my God. It's like a miracle. Like the Zero, this is ergonomically superior curved and smooth and comfortable to handle. All of the touch points are inviting. A lot of prosumer grinders are scaled down commercial ones, and they often carry that design language over. But a commercial grinder is something you work with. A home appliance is something you live with. Niche understands the difference. Swapping burrs is one of its main features, so let's start by making sure that it's not an ordeal. First, unscrew the adjustment collar, which also forms the hopper. Lift out the upper burr carrier. And undo the single bolt on the shaft. Lift out the rotary burr. Brush out the grind chamber. Drop in the replacement. Tighten the bolt. Drop in the stationary burr and replace the collar. It's intuitive and everything fits nicely. You get a case for storing the burrs with a cushion between them. There is a procedure for locating the best position for the upper burr and marking it with one of these little stickers. You simply rotate the carrier 120 degrees and then tighten the collar until the burrs just begin to touch. The farther you can tighten the collar before they touch, the more parallel they are. So you're looking for the carrier orientation that lets you tighten the collar the farthest. Calibrating or zeroing the grinder is easy too. You adjust the thin calibration ring by loosening this set screw and aligning the numbered scale with zero at the point where the burrs just begin to touch. Niche recommends calibrating the unit only with the espresso burrs installed. However, there's no reason why you can't rotate the upper carrier and find its best position and mark that with a sticker, just as you would with the espresso pair. Okay, now I've done the recommended calibration, let's try the whiteboard marker test. As I have said repeatedly, don't place too much stock in this. It's chiefly a measure of manufacturing care and design fitness. When the grinder is in use, crushing and chopping coffee beans, the conditions inside the grind chamber are vastly different from when we just spin her up unloaded and wipe off a little ink. I don't know if people appreciate how much force the coffee exerts on the burrs, but their alignment under a working load is only roughly predicted by this test. We're merely looking at starting conditions here. If they're significantly out of parallel, that is a problem. They'll touch on one side, which stops them from closing any further, while a wide gap on the opposite side lets big particles pass. A clamshell effect like this makes it almost impossible to dial in espresso or Turkish coffee. So in that case, you'd need to start shimming, but don't waste hours trying to align them to within a tenth of a millimeter. You're chasing a platonic ideal that really is imaginary. If the burrs are adjustable, there will be play, and the coffee is going to deflect them. 
but these are nicely parallel, suggesting very high standards of manufacturing and assembly. This is what I want to see. Let's follow that with an equally unscientific test for noise. Proper noise testing is done in a controlled environment with a meter that costs thousands. A barista with a phone app? Yeah, that's something else. You're going to have ambient noise, Alibaba's finest microphone, and software that might be completely whacked. So all we can do is compare. The manufacturer's claim here of around 78 decibels under a load is probably correct because it was probably checked correctly. So ignore the actual numbers you see here and pay attention to the comparisons and the quality of the sound. I'm recording with my Zoom H5 and I'll play it without any editing or processing. I'm grinding 10 gram samples for espresso in each case. So the duo is grinding for espresso now, and it's not a beautiful sound. And it goes on for quite a while. My phone app says 88 decibels. Now let's do the same with the zero. Looks like about 85, so if you know the zero, then the duo is hardly any louder. But I prefer the sound of this one. Now, let's check out the venerable beast. It idles at around 75 or thereabouts, and almost hits 90 under a load. Fortunately, you don't have to listen very long. And the idling sound is quite pleasant. I could fall asleep to that. And finally, this is the duo with brew burrs, set for pour over grinding. Wow, it's nearly as fast as the EK. Now, a quick look at retention. It's just about identical to the zero. After grinding several batches, I let it sit for 15 minutes to let any static charge dissipate and give it a smack with a brush handle and rock it back and let it fall forward. This is my standard test. We get two to three tenths of a gram, which is all you can really ask for. Let's have a look at the burrs. How do they differ? These are 83 millimeters from the Mazur Major, and at a glance, they look about the same. Same distance from the shoulder to the top of the flats, about 9.55 millimeters. Same distance from the shoulder to the inside surface, around 2.11 millimeters. So the basic dimensions are the same. Both have 12 breakers and 66 blades and flats. So what is the difference then? The area of the flats. They are a bit wider on the espresso burrs. There's also a difference in the distance from the cutting surfaces to the troughs between them. I don't know how well I can show this. You know my photography skills. The lighting just isn't working for me here, but take my word for it. The distance between the breaker surface and the deck is about one millimeter greater in the brew burrs, which means that when the flats are touching, the gap between them will be two millimeters bigger than on the espresso burrs. Near the circumference, you can see the same thing. The brew burr on the top has deeper troughs between the flats. The espresso one on the bottom is almost completely flat at the outer edge. This will enforce your upper size limit fairly strictly and give you a somewhat more regular particle shape. Now let's take it apart. There is an important difference between build quality and duty rating. This is not a heavy duty commercial machine. That does not mean that the build quality is low. People think so, they're wrong. This wristwatch is quite delicate, but the build quality is exquisite. So let's keep the differences straight. A caffeineaholic goes through maybe 200 grams a day. Your home grinder is going to be working under a load for 10 to 20 hours per year. It does not have to be heavy duty, like this brute over here. The bean hopper uh, slash adjustment collar feels a bit rough to me. I don't like this, so I'm going to relieve the pressure here as I turn it. We'll look at the threads a bit later.
One thing I do like is how the two flat rings underneath that bear against the Burr carrier are very precisely formed. The output shaft shows very little runout, around two thousandths or about a tenth of a millimeter, so quite good. We have three springs pushing the Burr carrier against the adjustment collar, which gives more pressure than we have with the Zero. A few countersunk screws and the upper housing comes away with the bearing carrier. The bearing is a bit grippy here, so I think the shaft needs like 30 seconds on the buffing wheel. Tolerances are nice and snug everywhere. There's the motor with its integrated gearbox. I examined the gears in my in-depth video about the Zero, but briefly, you have planetary nylon Delrin gears that are tough and durable. Some people object to this, but they're misinformed. In the worst case, a metal gear can abrade a plastic one and wear it out, but that's easily avoidable by not combining the two. We've got a brushed DC motor that runs on rectified AC. There's no transformer. It takes the full 230 volts. We know it's not a universal motor because it has permanent magnets. The PCB is nice. I'm going to remove it so we can see the components. It's held with two screws and two captured nuts. I'll just tape over the nuts so that they stay put. The toggle switch is rated for 277 volts AC at 20 amps, so more than adequate. There's also the safety switch, actuated by the little red plunger in the upper housing. It's all simple and direct. No integrated circuits, no firmware. We have four diodes, the black cylinders with the silver bands, forming a bridge rectifier. Nicely done, which will convert the AC sine wave into a DC sort of ripply sawtooth. You can see several capacitors and resistors to deal with the ripple and feed smooth DC to the motor. On the reverse, you can see it's been wave soldered. Really clean, and the fillets are all full and even. Nice high standards here. The burr carriers are made of a lightweight, soft alloy, but they have threaded inserts. Very nice. I see nylock blue patch used on all of the fasteners subject to vibration on the motor and on the burrs. Centering the burrs on the carriers isn't difficult. Of course, the ideal reference point is the output shaft, but that's not convenient. So, for the lower burr, you can use a makeshift feeler gauge, if you have a drill set. With curved surfaces, round is better than flat, unless it's very thin. Loosen the fasteners, give them just the merest torque to create some friction, and use the drill shaft to feel for the same tightness of fit all around. Then tighten the fasteners and double check. For the upper one, make aluminum foil shims. You get the right thickness by trial and error, and you work off the outside here. When all three feel equally snug, tighten the fasteners. As I said, the shaft is the ideal reference, but this will put you in the ballpark. And radial alignment is not really crucial with flat burrs the way it is with conicals, so don't sweat it. As I mentioned, the adjustment ring's movement felt rough to me. There could be an issue with the added spring pressure and or the large diameter hopper, which naturally increases the amount of torque you're applying. Anyway, it doesn't feel right, so I'm going to polish the threads, since I've got it apart. I'll use this Fordham high-speed tool. I'm not set up to do it here, so I'll do it off camera. I'm using a thin nylon brush here, and I'll start with some fine compound and finish with a super fine one if I need to. I'm going to polish both sets of threads. Okay, now that's done. I'll just put two layers of PTFE tape on the collar threads. I do this with my Zero, too. It creates a smooth resistance that feels good to me. Okay, this is completely different now. It feels... How do I put this? It feels more expensive. I didn't have this problem with the Zero, so I can't say if this is just a one-off flaw or an actual thing. Keep in mind that this is a late prototype, not a production unit. 
I'm sure that if this is a thing, Niche can fix it easily just by adding a polishing step for the threads, especially the collar ones, since they're harder, being chrome-plated metal, and need to be smooth to avoid galling on the body threads, which are made of a softer alloy. So one minute on the buffing wheel, I mean, that's nothing, really. A super easy fix for Niche. Still, I would advise that whenever you turn the collar through its full range, removing it and replacing it for cleaning and swapping burrs, etc., you should develop the habit of pressing down on the center here to take some of the spring pressure off. I also strongly recommend PTFE tape because it's dry, yet it lasts a lot longer than powders or aerosols. And of course, any sort of grease or paste lubricant will only attract coffee grit and eventually get messy, and possibly gritty enough for some galling on the softer body threads, especially with the increased torque from a larger diameter hopper. Now for some tasting results. I'll start with pour over. Our test subject throughout will be this bourbon and Tipica blend, which will be challenging. It's very acidic. I roasted it about two weeks before these tests, and I chose a level light enough for pour over and dark enough for espresso. You can see the silver skin is still bright compared to the bean, and that indicates the quiet period between the end of first crack and the start of second. Test batches were all dialed in for 4 minutes and 30 seconds with 30 grams of coffee and 400 milliliters of water using CAFEC T90 filter papers and a plastic V60 funnel. I like to look at the filter bed afterward. You can see the rough proportion of fines to mid-sized particles and boulders. However, I passed each sample through a 1.2 millimeter sieve to remove most of the chaff, which would otherwise lie on top of the samples and obscure the surface. So, a few boulders are missing here as well. The samples with the fewest fines and the best flavor were from the EK43. There was depth and strength and complexity all at once. In second place was the duo with brew burrs, very similar in character. Third was the Zero with my little trick of using the NFC disc and grinding only half the beans at a time. I have a video about that if you're curious. And worst was the Duo with Espresso Burrs. I see a thick layer of fines on top and flavor to match. I just wouldn't. Swapping them is so easy, just do it. Okay, for Espresso. I'm still doing those long-term tests of paper filters and metal screens that I place on top of the coffee puck to help keep the machinery clean, but not for taste testing. I don't want to introduce anything outside my normal routine that could affect the flavor, so there's nothing on top. I like the flavors I get from my Zero. I enjoy that roasty, toasty, bready, bitter sweetness that it likes to emphasize. The EK is great too, very steady, very predictable. It can bring out the worst in an acidic coffee. But the duo with espresso burrs, well, it was great. I got a broad range of flavors, brightness plus depth and body. Maybe the best all around, I don't know. It handled this sample of coffee very nicely. It definitely is touchier to dial in than the EK or the Zero. You might reach a point where it's better to change your dose slightly than touch the dial. Finally, the duo with brew burrs making espresso. I got the burrs as close as humanly possible without touching, and the coffee was still too coarse. This is the best I could manage. So, yeah, just swap the burrs as needed. Neither pair makes a good cup of the wrong kind of coffee. If you prefer single dosing and you want a machine with some real flexibility for under a thousand pounds, dollars, euros, etc., you're going to love this. So, have I got any complaints? Very few and very minor. The grind adjustment reference mark is hard to see. I'd like it to be more obvious. It's maybe a bit noisy. Not loud, really, but it doesn't have a nice voice. It's very slow when grinding for espresso, which is not necessarily a bad thing in terms of grind quality. Still, I wouldn't want it any slower. There is some occasional popcorning, not a lot. Feed mechanism is very good. Popcorning doesn't bother me at all, but some people find it highly offensive. But it comes with the territory. If it gets under your skin, maybe single dosing isn't for you. 
The Duo is available for pre-order now at £799, so I'll drop a link to the company's web store in the description. Coming up, we'll be learning more about that venerable beast, the EK-43. I'll finish that piece explaining why I dumped the flow control kit. I'll be pressing on with my top screen experiments, looking for the combination that keeps things clean without affecting flavor, and maybe I'll have some preliminary impressions of the bottom filters that I promised to play with. I'm not sure of the order, but I am sure that you'll find it all extremely interesting. So keep in touch. Cheers.